The 90 Day Fiance Tell All is over, and that means we finally have a new 90 Day spinoff to watch every Sunday. So let's say hi to some familiar faces, meet the new cast, and oh my god, it's Ed and Liz again. Yes, yes, after all their fights, all their seasons on television, they're on breakup number 90 million by now, who knows? After all their fights on toxicity, we are back to watching another goddamn season with Ed and Liz on it. The two of them now live together in Arkansas instead of San Diego, and they're hoping that a cheaper cost of living and a slower pace of life and being closer to Ed's family might do the two of them a bit of good. They're away from the hustle and bustle of everything, and the two of them claim that they had an amazing therapeutic experience on The Last Resort, if you watched that season. I've been here before. I have, I have a, a leprechaun costume. and They claim that they left that experience stronger as a couple, somehow. And now, together in Arkansas, they claim to have the healthiest version of their relationship yet. We're a beautiful hurricane, and now we're calm and the sun's coming out. And while even if that is true, even if their relationship is the healthiest version it's ever been, that's kind of like saying after all this hard work, they now have the cleanest pile of dog shit they've ever had. Like, yeah, I'm sure it's better than it used to be, but it's still a pile of dog shit. Also, they're no longer just living together. They are now also watching Liz's daughter, which is adorable. I, I love the kid. She seems great. But as a viewer, it really made me worried to see that because we know how abusive and toxic their relationship can get. And now the possibility of something like that happening again, but now with a kid being present and being able to watch all of that unhealthy behavior, it makes me pretty uncomfortable. And as part of starting this new life together in Arkansas, Ed and Liz have this great idea that they want to start a real estate business together. Liz and I are planning on, once we pass our state boards to become realtors, so we can start working as a team to list homes and sell homes. I don't know why they thought of that industry specifically, but I guess it would be kind of funny to see Big Ed's face on a billboard for real estate. But I don't really see how this is going to go well with the two of them. The relationship seems to be the worst when they have to spend the most time with each other. And from everything we've seen from previous seasons, it doesn't seem like they actually do well working together. It looks like she has no neck. No, there's nothing wrong with this picture at all. Okay, well. They even have this little test run where the two of them together are role playing as real estate agents and the daughter is the client. It's pretty cute. And again, the kid is adorable, but we already know what would happen. Ed's gonna talk a lot, probably flex a little bit over Liz, probably put her down in public in a way to prop himself up like he always does. He's gonna look like an asshole, Liz is gonna be pretty hurt, and they're gonna have to fight about it later. And I feel like their bad energy will be incredibly obvious to any clients. Like, I, if I'm buying a house, I do not want to be around this bickering couple. I'm trying to buy a house to envision my happy life together with my family, and meanwhile, this toxic ass couple is fighting and bickering with each other. They're gonna be the ones to sell me my dream future. Yeah, no, bad energy. If you guys both have to be real estate agents, shouldn't you just split up? Do, do your own clients. But they're committed to making this work and they think it would be good for the relationship. Again, I have no idea why. And after a few scenes with this real estate stuff, we then get an incredibly uncomfortable scene where Ed and Liz are pretending to not have a fight outwardly to shield the bad energy from Liz's daughter. And I guess I'm glad that they're trying, but this is still not good behavior to have around a kid. The three of them are getting together to bake some breakfast pizzas. And even though nothing bad has happened and no one's done anything wrong, Ed is worried that, well, it's baking, those flour everywhere. He's gonna be the one to have to clean everything up. I love having Riley around and she loves to bake, but I know I'm gonna have to mop the floor when we're done. I just can feel it. And instead of focusing on this quality family bonding time together, where we're all making food, breakfast pizzas, you know, how fun. He's already preemptively mad about everything and starts to take it out on Liz a little bit. You guys are making a mess. Sure. I know, but you guys are such so messy. Have you not seen yourself cook pasta? I don't make this big of a mess. Kind of annoying, but then Liz immediately claps back and is like, well, you think it's so messy here? You, every time you cook pasta, you just, you ruin everything. And she goes over to the stove, like, look at all this, look at all this mess you make from pasta. Which on Liz's part is just escalating the bickering. But I also kind of had to laugh because I was thinking like, how much of a mess can you even make from pasta? Then they do this back and forth bickering where I'm guessing they think, well, we're not raising our voices. We're clearly demonstrating hostility and disdain for each other, but we're not raising our voices. So this is okay. You know, everything is fine. Are you going to smile? Are you going to clean your mask? Or let this ruin your day? Would you stop ruining it? And you're pouting and you're stop. ruining the event. You stop being a brat because you're ruining it. And then the kid, bless her heart, then jumps in and says, well, do you think maybe we could not argue about everything and, and we'll just, we'll have fun and we'll clean it up later. What? 
And the two of them kind of recover after that and get back on track. But that's just, I don't want a kid involved in this. If I have to watch a TV show with Ed and Liz and they're gonna fight and be toxic and abusive to each other and all that, if I have to watch that, and I will watch that, if we're all gonna point and laugh and go, oh my God, you look at, look at Ed and Liz, I just, I don't want any kids involved. I am not excited to see where the two of them go this season. Up next, we have the couple that I'm most surprised about this season, Emily and Kobe. You might remember Emily and Kobe. Emily was this young, kind of free-spirited person who traveled around the world and ended up meeting Kobe, a native Cameroonian, as an underwear model in China. And the show keeps referencing that Emily used to go around and do things. But could we get more explanation on that? How did Kobe end up there? I'm very curious. Anyway, they met on this vacation, and because of their interaction, Emily got pregnant. And even though that wasn't part of the plan, Emily and Kobe are both very excited and choose to raise the kid together. Emily had to go back to America and give birth while Kobe was away because visa stuff, you know, he couldn't be there for the birth, which kind of sucks. But the last time we saw them was when Kobe was finally able to arrive in America and meet the kid and start to become a dad. And that's also when we learned that Emily freaking sucked. Emily, who was raising their kid with her family, was entirely used to doing everything in the world her way. And just as a personality, she's not the most giving. She could be quite demanding. My way or the highway, you will follow my rules. And that became a huge problem when Kobe arrived. And how dare he not immediately know everything he's supposed to do exactly as Emily wanted. And we saw throughout the rest of their season together, Emily just be so annoying, condescending, just talking down, just it, a really annoying way. Right, get in there, scoop it up. Why don't you just start from the big pile? Why are you Come, honey, just let me do what I'm doing. Why are you pulling it down? Are you serious? You just want to control everything. But since the last time we saw them, it's been a few years, and they even had a second kid together. And honestly, even though it's Emily, Kobe, and their two kids all together living in the basement of Emily's parents' place, it looks like their dynamic has drastically improved. It seems from what they've shown that Kobe has picked up the responsibilities well and doesn't seem to be annoying Emily too much. And it seems like Emily has learned to chill out a little bit and maybe share some of the responsibilities. But although things seem to be going well at home, their plot this season is that the two of them, the kids and the grandparents are all going to visit Kobe's native country of Cameroon, which according to the CIA at least is a danger level two and advises travelers to exercise a high degree of caution due to the threat of violent crime and the risk of civil unrest. And after a 22 hour traveling experience with grandparents and kids, I don't know how they survived that, they arrive to Cameroon and immediately we see Kobe being flooded with locals who are all swarming and crowding him seemingly to ask for money. They all stop at a Cameroonian fabric store where they all get some cool matching outfits. They meet Kobe's family and all of his siblings in this cute little reunion and everything goes hunky-dory until Kobe discovers from his dad that although Emily and Kobe have been married in the United States, they haven't been married in a traditional Cameroonian way. And until they've had that traditional Cameroonian wedding, the family doesn't completely recognize the two of them as a married couple yet. This whole thing was presented on the show like it was this huge, total big deal. Like, what? Oh my God, they don't accept us until we, we have to get married again? There was a bunch of cliffhangers and dramatic music, but the whole time I'm kind of thinking, well, what's the big deal? Okay, you have to have a second marriage ceremony. I mean, like, that seems kind of fun to me. But Emily and her family are a little stressed about it, and they don't know exactly what they're getting themselves into, which is where we leave them at the end of episode three. Up next, we have another fan favorite couple, Rob and Sophie. These two need no introduction. They were just on the last season of the show. Remember, Sophie is this British influencer lady that Rob claims is incredibly rich and bougie, although it kind of doesn't seem like that. And Rob is that insecure, struggling actor type that can't stop online cheating on her and thinks that anyone who wants a bathroom in their apartment is bougie. To everyone's great surprise, the two of them actually did end up getting married. Except now, Sophie moved to Austin, Texas to live with her friend, and Rob also moved to Austin, Texas, presumably so he can actually afford a toilet now. But while they are living in the same city, they're effectively estranged, and neither of them are exactly sure where the relationship stands. Sophie thinks Rob has some problems that he needs to work on. 
chiefly all the online cheating he's been doing. And until she can get some faith and reassurance that he has actually changed or even understands that what he did was wrong, she's not comfortable diving 100% back into the relationship and living together. Meanwhile, Rob absolutely wants his relationship to work and is essentially begging Sophie to give him another chance and can you just work on this together? You know, this is our marriage. I need you to not run away and, and work with me on this. But although Rob talks a lot about how he wants to work on things together, it really just kind of seems like he just wants Sophie to get over it and maybe doesn't understand exactly why Sophie's mad and that maybe he has something he needs to work on too. The two of them haven't talked in a few days, but after some pestering from Rob, Sophie decides to give it a chance and meet up with him. And they finally meet up together, and they're both relieved to see each other, they're just happy to be in each other's arms again, and that lasts for like three minutes, until immediately they start bickering about their problems. I mean, you moved out two months ago, right? Because right? of you. I didn't do anything that was you like... You didn't do anything, okay. So apparently, they got married two months ago before this scene, and a month after that, they reset Rob's phone, and somewhere in that process, Sophie discovered 50 bitches that he had been texting throughout their four-year relationship together. It was like 50 bitches in your phone, Rob. Now, we don't know the nature of these conversations, we don't know exactly how explicit these new 50 girls were, but even if they weren't too explicit in nature, he's already been completely thoroughly explicit with at least two other girls in their relationship, this whole online cheating business. So when Sophie discovers that he's been at least kinda texting all these people throughout the relationship, she doesn't trust him at all, sees it as the same kind of pattern, and leaves. And Rob's side of the story is that he didn't do anything wrong. Cannot take accountability, and you're always going to try to victimize yourself. I'm not trying to. You, like, if, you're not honestly, accepting me you taking accountability. Be, he just brushes right past this whole 50 girls thing and says, "Well, they just—they're just girls who DM me and tell me I'm cute and and try to talk to me." It was like 50 bitches in your phone, Rob. It was literally girls who hit me up, tell me I'm cute, or tell me, tell me, you know, just to try to have like a conversation. But I've realized these little small you're, interactions. You're, now I don't know exactly what these conversations are. If he's just getting DMs on like Instagram that says, "Hey, you're cute." and he doesn't respond, there's no interaction, it is kind of like, what's he supposed to do other than close his DMs? But considering he has a past of engaging with these kind of people and even asking for, you know, certain images that I can't talk about, then Sophie seeing any kind of DM would already trigger a lot of insecurity and suspicion. But again, if Rob is the kind of guy who has talked to these women in the past, I would kind of assume that it probably wasn't just girls DMing him and saying he's cute. He's probably liking the comment, you know, throwing a heart on there, maybe saying, oh, thanks, maybe even a, ooh, you too, girl. Maybe some kind of engagement where he's like, but, but I didn't, I didn't cheat, I didn't do anything, but she's like, bro, you've been talking to girls, like, what's wrong with you? At the very least, if you're in Rob's position, you're trying to win your wife back, you're trying to say, hey, you left me a month ago, you moved out, I would like you to move back in, and she says, yeah, you know why I moved out? It was because of all these things. And he hears that, and his first reaction is to just brush it off and be like, well, I didn't do anything wrong, that's ridiculous, like, what's wrong with you? Like, okay, do you want her back or not? Because brushing right by her feelings and not taking any accountability at all, not gonna work. So they have a big fight about it. Rob ends the conversation with begging, well, why don't you just come home so we can work on our problems together? I would like for you to come home so that we could try to work our shit out. Which again, earth to Rob, you know you could have worked on your problems right now, but you didn't. There's nothing magical about her now moving in with you. You're still not gonna work on your problems. And Sophie ends the fight saying, you know, Rob, you're just, you're the same person I left a month or two ago. You refuse to take accountability for your actions and you know, this just ain't gonna work. You don't get it. I have nothing to talk about. By the way, can you believe they said that on the first episode of this new season? You're unwilling to change and you're just like how you've always been. We're already at that point. I don't know what's going to happen for the whole rest of the season with the two of them. But we do have just a little bit more to talk about them because it's pretty funny. Because after some more begging and pleading from Rob, he's finally able to convince Sophie to try to come live with him at this new place so the two of them can work it out. And Sophie, reluctantly give it a chance, shows up and sees that he's left some flowers and a little note for her. And she sees the pretty flowers and is thinking like, wow, Rob, well, what a sweet guy. And then she starts reading the notes, which she's expecting is some kind of love note, some kind of an, uh, I'm sorry, I'm committed to you, let's work this out, you know, we're married, something like that. But it's actually essentially just a bullshit list of rules for her to follow for their relationship to work. It starts off with some basic rules about dishes and laundry, kind of domestic stuff like that. Washing off dishes before putting in the sink. 
putting dirty clothes in bin. Put makeup and hair products back after use. It doesn't say, hey, this is what we're gonna do to keep our living space clean. It's more of like an order for her to not make everything messy. But then it gets to this. Don't get mad at me <clears throat> when you don't get what you want. Be patient and I'll likely work it out for you. Remember that we're trying to move forward and don't focus on the past. <laughs> is, is Rob just stupid? Listen, I'm not trying to be mean here. I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to be a little funny, but really, it just, this, Rob, do you not understand anything? Rob online cheated with Sophie multiple times. He's sexting other girls. He's eliciting images, full on engaging with them. He has a pattern error. He's broken her trust. There's more things that she may have discovered in the DMs, all of which she's incredibly explicit in saying, this is why things aren't working out. It's this problem, this behavior, this pattern you have that I feel like you have not really taken responsibility for. These are the problems. These are your actions. This is how I feel about them. Just take responsibility for them. All you have to do is this. I'm laying it out right here for you. Acknowledge that what you did was wrong. Apologize for it. Show me that you understand that that's a problem. And then maybe I'll trust you more and then feel like we can do this relationship together. And Rob hears all that and says, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything wrong. Oh my God, you just keep focusing on the past. Can't you see that we should be working on our future together? Oh, please, would you please move in with me? Let's let's work on our problems together. We can do this together. Okay, now that you're here, uh, you have to agree to never get mad at me for my bullshit and let it go. Like, why did you think that that would work? Stop controlling me. How am I controlling? I, I encourage you. Do you or do you not count the toilet roll papers of how many I've used? Man, people will do anything to avoid taking responsibility for their actions. And before they say goodbye to Rob and Sophie, I did want to make fun of him just one more time because the two of them go out square dancing and actually kind of have a good date together. When Sophie has to pause the dancing and share with Rob that, hey, uh, you know you know my friend, my male friend back in the UK, he's actually in the United States and, and he's coming to visit tomorrow and you have to come say hi to him. He's coming to meet us tomorrow and I want you to meet him. And in the one-on-one -on -one where we see Rob and Sophie talking about it together, Rob's clearly very insecure, doesn't like this guy at all, and asks, well, what does he look like? Is he ugly? Which is really just letting the entire world know that you're insecure. What does so, this guy look like? He's a British guy. He has brown hair. Is he ugly? Sophie pauses and as neutrally as she can says, well, he's, he's not ugly. Is he ugly? He's not ugly. And Rob immediately does this little move. As if he's trying to say, well, see, see everyone, a guy is visiting her and he's not ugly. Like, see what I have to deal with, like all entitled? No, Rob, see what? What am I supposed to see? That a not ugly guy, that she has a friend that's not ugly and they're gonna say hi? And as if that wasn't obvious enough, he then says, if this guy doesn't look like Gollum, then, then I don't like it. If this dude doesn't look like, like Gollum, then I don't like it. And I'm just wondering, how do those words come out of your mouth and you hear yourself say that and not immediately become self-conscious of, well, oh, this is a me problem. I'm clearly insecure. I thought that, but now that I've said it out loud, I realized that, okay, this is, I'm taking this too far. Yeah, maybe this is something I gotta work on. It's always the people that cheat that are the most jealous, huh? That is a thing. And part of that is Rob could be cheating or doing some kind of scandalous behavior and then realize, well, I've been doing this shady shit without Sophie knowing about it. And if I've been getting away with it, then, then maybe she could be doing some shady shit and, and I wouldn't know about it. Does that mean she's doing that and lying? So maybe that's partly what's going on with Rob. But I also wouldn't be surprised if his deep rooted insecurities might go way back and that is actually what's causing some of his cheating behavior. Like he's just so desperately insecure about everything that he needs constant external validation to fill some kind of hole. And even though he's in a relationship with Sophie, he just needs something else and then goes out and just cheats to get rid of his insecurity. And maybe it's that same insecurity that's now preventing him from taking responsibility for any of his actions. Because if he actually acknowledges and lets himself believe that he's made mistakes, then he'll believe that he's more abandonable and that Sophie won't stay with him. That would be a good example about how someone's unresolved problems just completely cause chaos and destroy every relationship they're in. Or he's just a horny sleazebag and, and fuck this guy. I don't know, you tell me. Up next, we have another recurring couple from a previous season, Ashley and Manuel. And I don't have anything to say about them because I skip all of the scenes because I don't like them and I don't care. Up next, we have old favorites, Nicole and Mahmoud. 
Nicole is your stereotypical artsy, fashion forward LA lady who likes to dress all stylish and dye her hair, and she met relatively conservative guy from Egypt, Mahmoud. When she was on a spiritual journey to Egypt, they met and fell in love, and ended up getting married in like two weeks or something like that. They met in Egypt and they fell in love, and then Nicole went back to the United States, where Nicole proposed virtually, and then Nicole went to Egypt to get married and tried to stay there, but it didn't work out very well, and the two of them kind of split up, she went back to America, and as I recall, it was at that point that they then got on the show, where Nicole went back to Egypt for, I guess, the third time to try to live there and make it work with Mahmoud, but it was just too much of a culture clash, they couldn't figure out a lot of things, mostly about fashion and outfits. You know, she's a very liberal lady from the West Coast, and she's trying to move to conservative Egypt. I made quite a few videos on them last year, and I like those videos. Well, I mean, of course they make me cringe now, but I remember kind of liking them as a couple. They clearly have a lot of problems, and neither of them are very socially good. There seemed to be a lot of mutual childishness on both of their parts. And while Mahmoud was heavily criticized for being, again, pretty childish, but also just kind of having normal Egyptian values and not really liking the whole Western culture thing, Nicole was also the subject of a lot of criticism, mainly about how incredibly weird, stiff, and robotic she seemed. Although some people think that could be largely explained with a lot of Botox and anxiety, along with the childishness. But despite their problems, and there were plenty of problems, I couldn't help but feel when watching them that they did have some kind of kindred spirit, something about their essence that felt oddly familiar to each other despite coming from very different backgrounds. And I was cautiously optimistic that maybe if Mahmoud tried to come to America instead and the two of them could try to figure it out there, that things might actually work out between the two of them and they might even become a good couple together. That was last year, I have no idea if I will still feel this way in this new season, but we will be able to see it play out because in this season, Mahmoud is flying to America and the two of them will try to work it out as a couple. Naturally, the two of them are both incredibly scared and anxious because they've been trying to make this relationship work like three or four times by now, and every time they've tried to make it work, there's been too much of a culture clash and one of them ends up having to leave the other one and then everyone is real sad. This feels very much like this is their last chance to work on things together, so Mahmoud basically better like the United States if this relationship is going to work out. This is Mahmoud's first time being away from his family, and after a long flight, he finally arrives in LA, in his new home together with Nicole, and he's not that happy about it. I love you. I love you. Are you okay? Yes, honey, I'm just tired. You're American now, huh? Yeah, I do. Yeah? He doesn't look happy, he's not very warm. It is from his culture a little bit to not show a lot of PDA, but even when they're driving back in the car, Nicole's like, oh, so this is this is the area, like, you know, do you like it? It's like, what do you think about America? And Mahmoud just looks around like, hmm, yeah, it's, uh, hmm, don't like it. It doesn't look like he's trying to be mean or dismissive, like Manuel would be. I honestly think he's just really anxious, very scared, very tired. Uncertain about this whole thing just is so much to handle and process that he's just not the happiest camper right now. They drive back to her place, she's very excited, he's not. They arrive at her apartment, their new home together, she's very excited, he's not. He's also kind of uncomfortable with her apartment because she has this nude painting up that's apparently she did back in art school and, and it's cool to her, but he's still from a culture where you're not even supposed to wear a crop top. So he walks in and sees a nude full frontal painting and is like, uh, that is a little weird. And they go into the next room and because she's a seamstress or likes trying out and making new clothes, she has a mannequin, which is supposed to look like a naked human. And Mahmoud sees that and is like, what, uh, why do you have a fake naked lady here? Uh, that's for like when I uh, do listings for the clothes. Why not have clothes now? Because <laughs> it doesn't matter, she's a plastic doll. Which, honestly, if I have never seen a mannequin before or didn't know what they are, you just see like a disembodied fake human. You're like, what the hell is that? It's kind of creepy if you don't know the context. So he's confused, but again, that's already two kind of nude human body things right when he walked in. And even though that's totally normal in our culture, and I probably wouldn't think twice about it, she's the host here. She's hosting a guy from Egypt that she knows has these hangups about these things. They, they both are very aware that they have a cultural difference there. And I know it's gonna take both of them trying to meet halfway here, but I do kind of feel like if you're picking him up at the airport and this is his first time here, maybe you should hide that stuff a little bit or cover it up or, or something just to make him a little bit more comfortable. 
because I start to like go into this like doomed area in my mind that maybe he'll never like it. And that's like a huge concern of mine. So maybe he doesn't like living with all these naked women, <laughs> but she lived here before he did. So he's gonna stay. Anyway, they have some pretty sad frozen pizza and go to bed and wake up the next day feeling a bit better. And now that the two of them have got some rest, they head to Santa Monica Pier to go on a little date together. And this is where they have their first fight. Because they're walking down the pier when Mahmoud sees someone who seems to be dressed in a similar way to the women of his culture. Which at first seems fine and understandable, and he's even said so far that he's not really sure if he goes to America, will he even find other Muslim people? Are there going to be any Muslims? Is he going to find a mosque? Is he going to find other people from Egypt? You know, he doesn't really know if he's going to be the only one around. So I assumed that when he saw this other lady wearing a hijab, he might be thinking like, oh, what's, a, what's going on? I'm not the only one, maybe there are other people here, maybe I should get to know her, like, you know, something kind of like that. But Nicole did not interpret it that way. You like that? Yeah. The girl in purple. Why do you talk about him? And you know what I saw him. She immediately gets mad and jealous and accuses Mahmoud of just being interested in her, liking all these Arab women, and even says, well, if I'm not, am I not Muslim enough for you, Mahmoud? Stop dead in your tracks to there. Stop what? Like, if you want an Arab woman, you should go get one. Like, what? And after that, even says, well, after that incident, Mahmoud, I'm putting your ass back on a plane to Egypt. After that little incident, though, Mahmoud, I'm putting your ass back on a plane, you go what? back to Egypt, I don't care. What? This whole reaction from Nicole seems completely overblown. For one, even just watching it, it didn't look to me like his reaction was really that weird. She calls it an incident that he stopped dead in his tracks to stare and ogle, but it kind of looked, at least in the edit that we saw, that he was just walking around and then noticed and was just like, huh, and just looked. But also, even if he did stop dead in his tracks and just mouth open like, oh, like just staring like that, even then, I feel like I would have just assumed like, yeah, you, you see that there, there are other Muslim people here. See, you're not the only one. You'll fit in just fine. You know, kind of reassure like that. But I'm guessing with her that this is actually a culmination of many small things that have occurred up to this point. Because I mentioned before that due to all the stress and all the confusion and the pressure of everything that Mahmoud wasn't a very happy camper right now. But honestly, that was a bit of an understatement because ever since Nicole picked him up at the airport, he has been an absolute wet blanket. This whole trip so far, every scene we've seen them in together, Mahmoud has looked incredibly distressed, dismissive, and like he's doing anything in his can mentally to just not be here. He is the best. Why you punch all them there? It's for decoration. Okay, honey. I don't know, but it looks so weird. Okay, honey. It's so nice. You like it? It's nice. Although we could totally understand from Mahmoud's perspective if this is just a lot, the stress, the pressure, and that's just kind of freaking him out right now, it's just a lot to take in, I would still think that from Nicole's perspective, it's a lot of pressure on her too. She presumably wants this marriage to work out, and they have failed to make this marriage work out multiple times by now. The entire success of their marriage and future together is entirely dependent on how much Mahmoud enjoys being in America. There is a lot of pressure riding on him enjoying his experience here. And if the entire time so far, he seems like he's doing the exact opposite and very much not enjoying his time here, then I could understand if from Nicole's perspective, she's freaking out, but this isn't gonna work. This isn't a good fit. He doesn't actually like it here. Like, oh, this is my whole relationship might be falling apart. Like, ah, panic. I just hope that my mood really is just exhausted. And that's it because I start to like go into this like doomed area in my mind. And maybe he'll never like it. And that's like a huge concern of mine. And she's thinking, well, let's just do anything we can to have some fun. Let's go to Santa Monica Pier, have a good date together. Maybe show him why America can be pretty cool, but he still seems kind of cold and, and not really there. And then he sees the one Arab looking woman and then goes, oh, like that's, that's what I want. If that's what she's feeling right now, then I can understand if that was the straw that broke the camel's back or just made her snap. Like, you know what, fine, fine. If you just hated here so much and if you just want to be in Egypt and, and go be with an Arab girl or Muslim girl, like, fine, just do that. Like, I'm done, get out of here. I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's what's happening with her. But if it was something like that, I would tell her like, hey, you can just tell Mahmoud how you feel. She could go up to him and say, hey, I know this is a lot for you and I'm sure you're really tired and all that and, and I want to give you your space and, and I want to make sure that you're as comfortable as you can and, and let this acclimate but I'm also really afraid because I really want this relationship to work out and, and if it seems like right now, even if you're tired, that you maybe not are loving everything or you don't really like it here, then I get scared because 
I, I want you to like it here. I want this relationship to work out. And, and I'm, I'm really scared because I just, I love you so much. And I want this relationship to work and our marriage to work. And, you know, if you do something like that, then you're both on the same page. But as it stands, if you don't say anything like that and you just keep it in and, and they just go, ha ha, yeah. And you're just going, ha ha, yeah. Then yeah, you're going to blow up eventually. If you want to be a little womanizer, you can go back to Egypt. Okay, f I, I will, I'm done. I'm not going okay, to okay, now. Okay, good, okay. good. Okay. But this was only episode three, so they have an entire season together to figure this out. And uh, I hope they do. Uh, I'm not a betting man, but uh, we'll see what happens with them. And lastly, the final couple we have to talk about in the first three episodes of this new season is everyone's favorite couple, Gino and Jasmine. You know them, you love them, you hate them. And if for some reason you forgot who they were, the very first scene together is of Jasmine fucking sucking Gino's toe. What the hell, TLC? So we know what's up with the two of them by now. Jasmine is finally in America and complaining that Gino's living situation is kind of gross and too cold for her liking. But she's finally acclimating. They're having some fun together. The relationship seems to be going pretty well. But there's just one thing missing, which is Jasmine's kids. You see, part of their arrangement of Jasmine coming over to live with Gino in America is that ultimately her kids will also be coming to America. Jasmine might be enjoying her time here in America, but as she says, if it's either living her life here or going back to Panama and being with her kids, she's choosing the kids every time. She really misses them and is worried about the timeline of everything and is especially worried because Gino was the one that's been handling all the paperwork. Gino thinks he's an immigration expert and he has no money for a lawyer. So he's been doing it all himself and Jasmine has just been relying and hoping that Gino over here didn't fuck anything up. So after two episodes complaining about it, they visit the world's sassiest lawyer. Google oh. didn't tell you what to do. Where they learn that, yeah, Gino did kind of fuck it up. It seemed like in the original paperwork to get Jasmine over, Gino should have added her kids to that whole thing. In that ideal situation, Jasmine may only have to wait a couple of months before her kids join her in America. But because Gino didn't do that and was instead going to fill out their own paperwork separately, now it might take up to two years. Which, to put it nicely, is way, way, very, super much worse than Jasmine first expected. Now, Gino's hearing the lawyer say all this, that he fucked up, and that Jasmine is going to have to wait way longer to see her kids now, and is probably thinking, oh, God, I am so screwed. Jasmine's going to be so mad at me. Oh, no, I'm not even going to live to see next week. And if he was worried about that, he would be correct. Because after the meeting with the lawyer, they go to a cafe where they talk about it, the two of them, and Jasmine lets him have it. But actually, not really. Because at this point in the story, it's obvious to everybody, Gino messed up. And Jasmine has every right to be very upset and hurt right now. But she actually handles it pretty well. She's emotional and hurt and explains those feelings and then relatively calmly says, you know, I just, I, I need to have my kids and, and I wish that they were here and I'm so stressed. I never thought it would take this long and, and it feels kind of extra bad because it could have been avoided. Like you are meeting my kid's name. Just up for us. I mean, she still wasn't the absolute nicest about it, but all things considered, I was expecting way worse from her. But Gino's reaction tells a different story because he gets very defensive very quickly and essentially says, well, I'm sorry that I did all this work and made one little mistake and that ruined everything. I missed one, one thing. And despite Jasmine's hurt feelings, it seems like her core point is, I want to make sure my kids get here as quickly as possible. You messed up already. So I think now we need to get a lawyer, right? Right? You are not a lawyer. And that's the part, I mean. that, uh, that's the part that I want you to understand, you know, you could have good intentions and I get it, but. Which in my opinion is actually very healthy of her because she's not focusing on everything Gino did wrong and really harping about how dumb and stupid and incompetent he is. She's actually focusing like, okay, you made a mistake, but but the goal is the kids. They need to get here quickly. How are we gonna do that? We need a lawyer. Can we get a lawyer please now? Yes. But Gino doesn't budge. And as he said a hundred times up until this point, that's five grand. I don't have the money for a lawyer. I, I, we can't hire a lawyer. Doesn't matter what she wants. I don't have the money. Can't hire a lawyer. I'm in debt. Don't have the money. That's why, please hire a lawyer, you know. And I'm not, but I'm not going to use a lawyer. I cannot take that risk. And honestly, watching this scene with Gino is a little frustrating because I think we're all in agreement here that, yeah, Gino did mess up. It's not the end of the world, but Jasmine is hurt and she's being very functional right now and saying, okay, but, but we need to get this right. And it seems like for some reason, Gino just has a wall up and says, nope, nope, can't do it. And, and doesn't seem to be willing to say, hey, you know what? 
I'm sorry. I did mess up. I, I thought I had it under control. I thought we could have saved the money. I did mess up. I'm sorry about that. He doesn't seem to be able to really take accountability for that. Don't sit there and criticize me for all the hard work I'm that I've done. I'm not criticizing you. He mentions that it was her responsibility too, right? She could have Googled and became more aware of the documents. and. I think that's a valid point. Maybe she should be a little bit more hands-on about it. But his refusal to take any accountability here is like, Gino, you messed up. Like, just say sorry. No, no, I'm not. I no. can't believe it's from you, Gino. What, I'm do what kind of? And I think because he's not able to take any responsibility, Jasmine only gets more mad, and then this happens. I'm begging you. Yeah, and I'm you. telling you, I'm I don't care. You. You'll be okay. And you you're screwed up in your dumb head. Wow, wow, what on us? And Jasmine cries and Gino gets mad and storms off. And as frustrating as Gino's behavior is here, and as much credit as I'd like to give for Jasmine for actually handling it all pretty well, we can't just forget all the times Jasmine has been incredibly hateful, mean, hurtful, just saying the worst things to Gino whenever they have a fight. I wouldn't be surprised if, given their long history of these kind of fights going very poorly for him, that maybe for hours up until this point, he's already been triggered and in defense mode. He would have known going into the lawyers meeting that this is a big deal. We're talking about Jasmine's kids here, we're figuring out what their future is, and if I messed up, she's gonna kill me. She's gonna be so mad, she's gonna threaten to leave me and go back and divorce. She's gonna say all these terrible things and, and he's probably pretty scared of that, even if he wasn't completely conscious of it. Then they're in the lawyer meeting and he finds out that yes, indeed, he messed up and he knows Jasmine understands that. I wouldn't be surprised if going into this cafe meeting with Jasmine, Gino is probably already incredibly triggered and just ready for the worst fight of his life. I don't know if that's how he feels, but it sure wouldn't surprise me. I would definitely be like that. So then when they start talking about it and Jasmine actually is kind of normal and healthy and not freaking out at him, if he's still in that triggered, which he's about to blow up on me, I'm about to get it. This is about to go very terribly. He's probably just bracing for that and it's going to limit how functional the conversation can be. Maybe I'm giving Gino too much credit. You know, maybe he just really doesn't like taking any accountability or maybe he's just being cheap about it or something. But I'd find it hard to believe that all of those previous fights that they've had throughout their time together wasn't somehow affecting him. That's all I'm saying. And that's all I got for today's video. Let me know what you thought about any of these couples in the comments down below. What do you think is going to happen? What's your favorite? Who's your least favorite? And I hope you enjoyed this longer video where I've had to summarize three episodes at an hour and a half each in here. So I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, if you enjoyed this video and you enjoy my contents, make sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, hit the join button, ring the bell for notifications, and every comment helps the algorithm. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.